Okay. My name is Maria Kamilovska, and it's the fourth year in a row that I uh, do this lecture in with a corpus linguistics. I'm the final year uh, PhD student with the research group of computational linguistics, and my key area of uh, expertise and uh, research interests is uh, empirical translation studies, translationist studies, which is the major uh, direction of studies in translation in corpus-based translation studies. Empirical translation studies is corpus-based translation studies. It's the same thing, right? So this, and I think, synonymous these two um, identifications of the field of study. And within this, I'm interested in translation quality estimation applied to human translation, because translation studies is usually, uh, translation studies as a discipline is usually focused on human translation, right? And whatever, uh, and machine <laughs> translation is, um, well, it is part of translation studies, but it's not usually discussed no. in translation studies no. conferences. No. Machine translation is a separate, it's own field, and it's kind of, it is listed in, uh, uh, say, uh, in uh, the mappings of translation studies, machine, machine translation studies, right? But it's, scholars do not usually do that. <laughs> Uh, well, and uh, my uh, it is uh, my personal goal for this session is to talk through my recent findings, systematize uh, what I've learned in these four years of doing research on translation, on translationism and translation quality estimation. Folk are uh, using translation as indicators. And uh, I believe uh, in uh, the so called articulatory thinking. When you articulate, when you talk about things, you get to understand things. So I'm hoping for new insights uh, in this three hours uh, session. So I'll be, uh, I have a pen and paper, so if something <laughs> drops in, I'll. Uh, register it. Uh, in terms of, we have three hours, and I tried hard to make it a three part structure. And I will, in the first hour, I hope to present uh, translation studies as, um, as, uh, um, as a discipline which is focused on understanding the linguistic specificity of translations and uh, types of translations, varieties, translation varieties, with a focus on translation quality, with the application to translation quality, because when in translation studies, everything's about quality, right? <laughs> translations, uh, even the definition of whether it's a translation or not translation, can be uh, pinned to quality. So if it is uh, if a rendition of a source text is not accurate enough, you can say it's not a translation, it's a retelling or adaptation or something. So it, it kind of has to do with the uh, criteria of quality. In the second end, so I will talk about, I will present my, my, my PhD or research as uh, uh, conceptually, in terms of how I intend to, uh, what's my hypothesis and how I intend to approach it. And then I will give the background in, uh, in terms of empirical translate, study of translations, uh, discuss aspects of quality and operationalization of quality in both machine translation and human translation. And uh, I think one of the most important uh, issues here, especially when you talk about human translation quality, is how you benchmark translation quality, whether people, humans agree on, human tra on translation quality in general and human translation quality in particular. And this is a big part of the talk. I will describe how translation quality, be it machine or human, is benchmarked. 
Uh, in the second hour, I will talk about another key aspect in this type of, this type of studies that's featured. How do you represent text? How do you convert strings, text, words into numbers? How do you, which representation, which representations you would use to learn about translations in a machine learning or uh, any statistical type of quantitative empirical type of inquiry. Not when it's not when you uh, do case studies like you focus on one word and you <laughs> count occurrences of this word in five texts and comment on. Uh, Contexts of those five examples in ten texts. This is this is like kind of it's not statistically relevant. It's uh, anecdotal evidence. It can be insightful. It can be used as a hypothesis to test on a big scale on a, in a corpus uh, uh, corpus based um, environment uh, setting. Uh, but it's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about the uh, the quantitative quantitative analysis and uh, extracting features on a large scale from uh, hundreds of texts. And, and in, the third, in the third hour, I hope to uh, present the work workflow of uh, a translationist studies, uh, which I hoped, when before I started preparing it, I hope that can be used as a um, as a template for end of semester uh, essay that you are supposed to produce. Well, I shared some scripts, I've shared their repository, GitHub repository, but it would require a fair, some, some knowledge of Python or ability to run Python scripts at least. Well, I'm going to I'm going to describe how I do that. I share the script. I know I, I I describe how to get the data, where you can get the data. So if you if you have if you feel like you have this, uh, you you can run the scripts. Then that can be a, a template, can be a workflow. Okay. Uh, well, my uh, PhD research topic is translation is based human translation quality estimation. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a long attributive phrase, isn't it? And in English, to any language, I think to many languages, uh, translation, it would be one of the uh, triggers of translation errors when you interpret uh, long uh, in attributive phrases. So, <sighs> Human translation, translation quality, quality estimation are their own phrases that can be commented on in their own right, right? And this human translation quality estimation in my, uh, my work is centered, is built around using translationese indicators to solve this task. So translation, uh, human translation quality estimation is a task, can be viewed as, as a task, as an NLP even task, right? Then my approach, I, what I'm testing, my key uh, question is whether translation is, translation is indicators, the, 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 the intensity of translational properties of texts can be used to predict quality. That sounds <coughs> good. The more, the more, the more, uh, the more foreign a text sounds, the lower the quality. Maybe right when you read translations, you do have this uh, master Yoda type of uh, feeling, speech type, type of like when it's not uh, exactly the target language, the expected target language norm. So you expect. Uh, you have some expectations and then you read the text and it does not, it sounds like a bit wrong. And if this feeling of poorness is strong, it might be an indicator of a poor translation, right? 
Sounds reasonable. That's what I'm testing. Uh, well, <laughs> that is that is reasonable if we agree that translation, human translation quality can be benchmarked, can be represented uh, in a reasonable way, right? That's yes. another big question. Whether we can produce uh, labels, quality labels that are learnable at all, right? If, if humans disagree about translation quality, how can you teach a machine to do that? My background here, well, and uh, so that's, that's a more general question, whether and, and any algorithm based on be it translation is features, be it some other type of features, um, sentence embeddings, long formers, whatever, vectors, can uh, any of these representations, can more than representations, capture the labels that are available for human translations? Are these labels good enough? Are they learnable at all? Okay, so I'm using a number of translation quality labels and continuous scores, binary labels and continuous scores. And the key question is whether translation is good for this task. And I'm comparing translation is as a representation for texts with other feature learning approaches. What this uh, translation is indicated would be feature engineered approaches, right? They would be, you hand engineer translation is indicated. You, Manufacture them, right? You write rules for instruction. And feature learning approaches such as uh, uh, sentence bird encodings, uh, uh, TFIDF, any, any type of vectorization. <laughs> Applicability of this sort of inquiry would be to get insights into how translations are different from expected target language norm why translations constitute its own um, subsystem in a target language, and whether, the, whether this difference can be minimized uh, in, in educational environments when teaching translators, because we, as translation teachers, we don't want translators, translations to stand out as weird texts, right? And for machine translation, that translation is can be indicative of of poor quality too, right? Uh, additionally, uh, if we subset, if you, if I bring up the subset of questions or cu curiosities uh, that I have about translationese uh, side of things, translationese researches, I'm asking whether most of translationese is about interference, whether uh, Translations are weird because they uh, because translators experience the pull from the source language system and lose their not translators lose their natural ability to speak good good target language good mother tongue and produce weird strings that uh, in uh, they would not produce if not on the duress of if not on, on the forced. Uh, uh, conditions of translate of pr producing translation. Uh, so, how much of translation is about shining through is about interference or a source language pool? Then, uh, what other factors are in, or what, what other factors influence the, the strengths of translation? Is the or the type of translation is produced. Uh, usually they discuss professionalism, or competence levels. So the, 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 the less experienced a translator is, the more likely they are to produce lower quality translations or more, the more likely they are to produce uh, more translationese, more foreign sounding texts. My background here is a uh, translation teacher have been uh, in translation education for more than 10 years. And my professional experience uh, tells me that learning translator, it's really true. And this is why I engaged in this research in the first place, because I, uh, grading translators, translations, learning translations year in and year out, I felt a very pattern that I felt bored 
marking the same errors, not annotating the same type of errors every year, even though the text would be different, but I would do the same. And I thought, oh, <laughs> that's patterned. <laughs> A machine can learn that, <laughs> right? Uh, so professional uh, professional levels, competence levels can be a factor. Professionals might be expected to produce less translation needs and higher quality translations, which is contested, which is not, which, which some, well, at some conferences they say, well, how do you define professionals? Who's a professional? They're good students too. Well, but this is real life labels, real life categories. And if we if we're talking about hundreds of texts, that's probably will sh the difference will probably show. Then register or genre, uh, register or genre, which are we are not going to discuss the terminological difference here. But, um, I have seen that, or it's shown in other other people people research that depending on the register, depending on the type of text you would get more or less translation ease in translations. Like in fiction, translations in fiction, in my research, are less distinguishable from non-translations than, say, news commentary corpus, and then mass media texts, right? And this is, this is, this, this is well aligned with intuition. When a professional translator <coughs> Routinely translates media or uh, media content on a daily basis. Uh, uh, they would probably be very routine and would use reuse the same um, solutions, translation solutions, right? While when translating fiction, that might be a different attitude, a different time frame, a different professional norm, right? professional expectation. Then also another factor that influences the amount of translation ease in texts, in translations, is distance between source and target languages. It, is, it has been shown that there is more translation ease if the languages are further away from each other, like Chinese and English, or, uh, and there is less translation ease um, if, between German and English, for example, right? So there, um, Russian and Ukraine, almost no translation is undistinguishable. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yes. So my question might be silly, but uh, how is translation different from <laughs> translation? Right, so I, I did not define, I think it's the next slide that defines the term translation <laughs> means, but it's yes, 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 okay, it's okay. Usually, well, actually translation means is metonymically used to refer to translations in some papers, especially in uh, uh, machine translation related publications when researchers talk about, not scholars, but researchers talk about translation means, they apply it as a uh, as a, another word for translations. But uh, <clears throat> that's, I, I, in my opinion, that's metonymic use of term, not, not the exact terminological use. Because for me, translation is, is the, a set of properties of translations mm -hmm. that make them different from non-translations. So it's, it's what, it's the specificity. Translation is, is, trans <clears throat> is the property of, of a text to be a translation, it's not the it's not the translation, right? So translations so translations have a property of uh, some translations are more translations than other translations. If that makes sense. Some some translations so talking about the degree of quality. They seem it's more natural, or they seem more. Quality. Yes, 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 exactly. So some, some sometimes, well, I and with my students, I stayed an experiment whether they would be able to distinguish. A translation from a non-translation, right? And uh, so they are looking at two texts that are in the same language, in the target language. Like, do you think you would distinguish translation and non-translation? If you do, you 
how it how good can it be? Depends on what. It depends on the quality of the translator and the experience. Or I mean, okay, 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 okay. If we take the best quality translation, actually in two thousand six, there was a research by Roy and Peter Bandini, probably probably heard because it's a very famous research. They offer they used uh, published translations extracts from published translations of for fiction from English to Italian. Uh, and they asked humans to distinguish trans uh, translation into Italian and the original Italian text. They selected extracts so that they're not giving away uh, the original language. So they were pieces of text, right? Not whole books. People were only able uh, to tell the difference with the with the accuracy of 84 percent if i remember correctly so they, they you wouldn't feel that there is a translation it's 84 percent a machine in their experiment was able to tell the difference with the accuracy of 96 percent almost 100 so uh but also in my experience the more uh the more uh, you know about translations, the more uh, aware you are of translationese, the better the chances that you would tell a translation from a non-translation because you know where to look, right? You know what to look at. You know what, well, I, I think the next slide again has, yeah, which we, uh, like, you know which features uh, I usually, are, associated with translationese and with translational uh, language choices. Okay, all right, let's move on. Uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. On that last point, the paper you mentioned, uh -huh. the study you mentioned, the conclusion there would be that they're not necessarily linked. Like something can be obviously a translation when analyzed by a computer, but humans still yeah, struggle yes writing. yes yeah. yes 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 this is this is the conclusion they made that uh, machines are way better in capturing translation is than humans yeah. especially non-professional human, humans consumers of actual translations so you do not see the difference so it's like this kind of non-judgmental it leads us to a non-judgmental approach to translation ease yes yes yeah. exactly words. when when the term translation is appeared first yeah they uh, insisted that it is not it's not connected with the value status with, with evaluation of translations yeah. however my stance on this is kind of different mm -hmm. In the last paper I submitted to Target Journal, the reviewers said, and I tried to stick to that point that it's not ju judgmental translation is is um, is always seen in professional translations too. And we're talking about high quality professional translations. Trans okay, let's start with this axiom. Translations are always different from non-translation to a machine. So the, a machine would always be able to distinguish translations, human translations, from non-translations in the same language. That's being on structural features, of, even on, uh, it's experimental as well. Yes, it's, ex it's experimental, right? right. right. On um, well, you, depends on how you stage the experiment. If you are um, on a pair and you use lexical strings surface lexical features, your accuracy for a machine would be a hundred percent. But that's cheating. This is not fair. Because in translated texts, you would have character sequences that do not appear in target language. Like like if you translate something from Japanese into into English, you would have what we, or from Chinese, you would have this 
<laughs> names, proper names that are not, that do not appear in, uh, in English, in non-translated English, right? So it's like kind of cheating. If you exclude these features, and, uh, and this is one of the requirements to, one of the desired qualities of a translationist or detect indicator, that it shouldn't be based on content, it should be content independent. It should not, it shouldn't uh, use surface lexical features like tokens, uh, lemmas, uh, character strings, because that would rather reflect the difference in the domain between your translate, translational corpus and your reference and your non-translational comparable corpus than translational properties than true translate uh, true um, then linguistic behaviors that are induced by by the situation of translation right yeah right so this is uh, well so <laughs> we are to the we thank you for this question because it brings us to the to the key question whether translation is is about quality I would argue that the amount of translation is about quality Right? The more translation is, the lower the quality. Translation is always there. Translations are always different from non-translation. But the more they are different, the worse they are. Right? There should be a threshold after which you would say, oh, this, okay, this amount of translation is bearable. That's professional translation. Therefore, you reach this level, you, okay. That, well, this is the question. Does specificity of translate so specificity of translations correlate with perceived quality? We are not discussing on how to benchmark this quality uh, as of now. For now, right? Assume we have a God-given uh, uh, quality labels, right, for translations. Can we use translation features to, to predict this label? To uh, support this claim. I would use, uh, I use the list of 10 uh, issues, typical issues in translation that, uh, in learned translations <clears throat> that are usually discussed in translation textbooks. If you have translation education, you would probably, if you attended tr practical translation classes, you would probably remember that the teachers would tell you, oh, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Tra Learned novice translation translators usually do that, and this is wrong. And we're doing this, and, what, and this is the, the natural, the natural uh, uh, impulse of a translator to do this. But you should, a professional would uh, uh, try and refrain from easy solutions, from the solutions that first come to your head, and which would would be uh, contributing to the translationese properties of translation, right? For, well, I think that many of these are, this is for English Russian, but I think many of them are also, are also apply to other language pairs. For example, overuse of possessive for pronouns when you translate from English. So this, this possessive pronoun would be carried over into translations, which is not a Russian, which is not typical for Russian, which sounds, gives us weird sound. Then, uh, Russian is uh, does not have a uh, direct word order or um, like fixed word order. So, but translators would copy uh, the, the fixed word order subject predicate object from English. So there would be a lack of reverse of uh, the uh, word order which starts with a verb in Russian in in, in translated Russian. Then analytical passives, unlike English, in, uh, Russian has four passive constructions, four ways to express pass passive constructions. The thesis, the relations between a subject and object. And of course, you would see uh, overused analytical, an analytical passive is one of the options, one of the four options. So you, you would use uh, uh, tr translations would feature more analytical passives uh, to the detriment of more natural and more actually more used uh, ways of expressing uh, passive 
facilitate the diastasis, is it? Diastasis. Okay, uh, then I like this one. Overuse of propositional phrases. It has to do with theme ream, with uh, functional sentence perspective. Uh, in English, you would um, often have uh, propositional phrases like about him at the end of the sentence, which are unstressed, right? I totally forgot about him, about him right? That's like the end. This is not uh, a rheumatic part of the sentence. This is not the focus of the sentence. Russian uses word order to convey the functional te uh, text perspective. And when this word order is copied over, um, propositional phrase becomes stressed, can, uh, becomes, um, becomes the focus of the sentence, communicative focus of the sentence, which is wrong, which leads to eruptions in the information flow in the text. And this is a, uh, but in terms of quantitative analysis, you would have a lot of, uh, you would have increased um, frequencies of prepositional phrases in the absolute sentence end, right? Um, what else? Oh, this is this is this is universal. I think I've worked with several language pairs, and I've always seen that lengthening your sentences and more uh, relative pools is more relative statistics for relative pools is this is a very good predictor of translation is how many relative clauses are there for, uh, on average in a text translations would always have more i uh, think that it is again lack of creativity and um uh falling victim of uh easy solutions in translation when you when you unpack english uh constructions with non-finite verbal forms and uh, you use just crude force uh, adding clauses and unpacking them to the full right without looking for nominalizations um maybe ver other uh, uh, russian or Tamil language verbal or prepositional phrases to convey the same idea it's always easier to just uh, unpack it into clause right and in the end you would have uh you uh, you would have sentences like which have which 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 that that that, that in one sentence like five times right oh this one is uh, uh a typical giveaway of translation of uh, of a translation from english at least which i think and i believe while the target language would have other ways of expressing uh, author's stance, right? Or um, modal verbs. If your language, if your, your target language does not have modal verbs, like Russian has one modal verb <laughs> compared to, uh, compared, well, actual uh, the modal verb which is used in predicate. Which can be, uh, which can constitute for the model predicate one compared to ten English. Of course, that would be overused. It would be massively overused. And this, this is one feature that can predict translations from non-translation. Even if you're a professional translator, you would sometimes be tempted to use uh, pre, um, to, uh, to use predicative modality or modal verb in predicate uh, rather than uh, parenthetical constructions, modal constructions, which are more typical, typical for Russian, for example. Or use of connectives is universal, right? Be uh, because of explicitation. Well, in, uh, in general, translations would be longer, wordier, more repetitive. At least this is what the textbooks say, right? Okay. Uh, going to uh, another, well, I, now I will move to speaking about how you can, how can uh, we benchmark quality. We have started talking about professional varieties, about competence levels as one way to represent quality on the assumption that 
who would expect professional translations to be of higher quality than learning translation, right? Following this um, assumption, there was um, there was over a dozen purpose projects that collected learned translators translations collected learned translations are in the, in with the view of generating. Uh, recommendations in terms of improving educational systems and also uh, for, in my case, for trying and capturing translation quality, or in this case, professional varieties, right? Can I distinguish professional varieties using translation as features, right? Usually these learned translator <laughs> corpora uh, they usually follow the Melange project uh, template, and it was a big project that ran for many years, was very influential in the area. Usually, these projects, if you're a translation teacher, right, you would hate to throw away so much of your effort on grading translations, right? So at some point when computers, uh, computational technology is allowed, you start collecting them. And this is how I think this 15 uh, projects actually originated. So they were translation teachers who collected student, their student translator, translations, maybe saving annotations, maybe saving grades, Usually these corpora are very small size. They count like 40, 20 translations and multiple uh, sources and multiple translations to them. Because you would have a group of students who translate the same text, right? So these are multiple, multi-parallel corpora, right? That's one um, uh, feature of this sort of corpora, type of corpora. Also, error annotation is usually done in broad. Uh, this is one approach, and I, I've seen like five projects that do the same thing. Yeah. No, why it doesn't click? Okay, okay. Sorry, I just wanted to demo. Are you familiar with the broad annotation uh, system? I, I'll just quickly show if I can. No. Okay. Okay. But error annotation is important because it is one of the one of the approaches to one of the approaches to capturing quality, right? And just to give you a feel of how what it looks like. This is it, right? This is brought a uh, typical, and the, I, I would say the best available as of now tool for error annotation. You would have uh, uh, color coded error types assigned to a span. Um, Okay, let's annotate something. Like you, you select this. You think you think this is an error. Bam. You choose the type of error. You write a comment. <laughs> you choose the uh, severity, major, critical, or minor. How how severe this error is. You also can choose additional uh, additional comment as of why this error occurred to, according to you, right? And then the link to this, I used to send the link of this, uh, of annotated translations to students and they could uh, see the comments, like hovering a mouse over span would reduce, um, would give a bubble with uh, the comment. So kind of, I, I'm not sure how, whether that was useful but this is how it's done from the research this is from educational point of view from research point of view it has 
Broad produces standalone files that are machine readable and that can be used for calculating uh, quality score based on errors, on types of errors and uh, number of errors. Right. Despite this type of corpora are being collected for more than 20 years now, there are hardly any big quantitative, big scale quantitative research based on that. First, because the corpora are small, uh, and second, because there are because with this sort of annotation, there's no access to the source uh, source side of the text, right? Which is a limitation. You cannot you cannot compare sources and targets. You you only have access to targets, not to sources, not to error treaties. Because and there's no annotation tool I checked, no annotation tool that would allow you, except for Excel spreadsheets, uh, that would allow you to annotate both sides of the corpora. Uh, so this is a limitation. This is a limitation. And also this, right? This is what, what the, my, PhD, my the stumbling block in my PhD is. Lack of consistency. Learn a corporate or collect real life assessment, which are, uh, which can be produced in different, uh, at different times, in different years, by different people. For, for uh, in, di in different conditions for different purposes, so they're difficult to they're too heterogeneous to to give um, reliable estimate of quality. I think that might be that's 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 a reasonable thing to suggest, right? But they're real life, so they have a one benefit: they're real life. So if you're in artificial, if you benchmark your quality artificially, like training people specifically. Limiting them in time, they're the same sort of people, they have the same instructions. Of course, they would agree more, right? They would be, but this is artificial. Does, it, does, does this sort of assessment happen in real life? No. That's, that's, what I, that, uh, that's what I think can be discussed here. Uh, this is a description of the corpus that I collected that my, this is my, <laughs> the way the corpus, which is, uh, yeah, part of those 15 projects, of uh, one of those 15 projects. Um, <coughs> well, I will highlight a few things. First, most of, of the trans, um, for my research, I use a very homogeneous subset of this corpus. It's a big corpus, right? But I use very a small homogeneous but homogeneous subset. Most of these translations are produced by final year translation studies undergraduates. All of them have Russian as L1, which is not the luxury that you would have in uh, a European institution where you would have translators with different L1s, which is a factor and which makes which undermines the, the homogeneity of the of, of the collection, right? Well, it comes from several Russian universities, so it's not does not reflect the teaching uh, strategies in one particular university. So it's kind of variety, representatives, re representativeness of the corpus. Well, I have error annotations uh, for five for twelve thousand sentences uh, spread uh, across five, more than five hundred targets. And also, I have uh, by, uh, I have grades that are not linked to error to error annotation, but which come from collected from translation contests, state exam grades that were maybe assigned holistically by uh, by translation teachers in different universities, depending on which assessment scheme uh, the university adopts. So I collected the assessment uh, sheets from universities with the translations, right? So I would have a grade, a mark, and the translation. But I don't know how this grade came about, right? So 
so it can be this great can be also when you when you are i've been a, on a jury in dozen of contests and i've collected translation in it from from in the results of the of the competitions and also different competitions have different requirements for translations to one are that this is this is the uh, this is the lack of unification here right but on the other side so on the other side on the other hand i i limit my collection to only mass media texts i do not include any other register it's only uh, translations of texts that were published in a newspaper or in, an, in a magazine uh, so and it's also this this uh, yeah 90 percent of this corpus is mass media texts uh, right right from this <laughs> from this corpus I subset four distinct uh, collections with various quality labels. The colored circles are different quality labels and their, and their sizes relative, I, I, relative, which is, uh, this is a true scale of the size of each collection. So I have uh, binary labels, which I produced by taking top two and bottom two on the assessment uh, sheet, right? This is best and worst translations, good, bad, right? So I uh, did not consider anything between these two. So I ranked all the translations and got the top and the bottom, three or two or one, depending on how many I had. It's a binary label, binary label, the binary label. Then error annotations, error annotated, no, green is error annotated, and uh, blue uh, are unique, one random translation of student translations to be compared to professional translations. So this blue or circle is the subset that I compared to professionals. And I cannot afford multiple translations because uh, that would lead in machine learning environment that would lead to uh, unfair representation, repetitive nature of student translations because uh, the machine would see this the same um, translations to the same text. So I cannot afford to use multiple translations. So multiple nature is rather an unnecessary feature in this sort of uh, uh, research it might be used, and I've seen it used in descriptive case studies when they compare several translations, say, oh yeah, this translation is better than this three. Uh, but this is, <laughs> but for machine learning experiments, you have to discard multiple nature of the corpus. Uh, getting a bit ahead of my story, I will just report the, the, the other two components of, of the research corpus which is comparable professional uh, translations um, and co uh, which were collected from BBC Russian service um, as a, a news, um, an aggregator of translations from foreign um, newspapers called Inasmi and Russian national corpus, which has a parallel subcorpus and a mass media uh, in it as well and then I got I have comparable non translations original texts originally authored in Russian and scored in Russian national corpus with and I, I'm using to balance my collections I use a random uh, sample of this big um, resource just to to have around 400 texts in each of the three subcorpora Um, I would skip the discussion 
of differences between machine and human translations. I'm sure you're aware of them. You probably have talked about them in, in other classes, except this slide was important for me to, uh, to demonstrate why machine tr translation uh, or approaches to quality estimation used in machine translation are not applicable or not really applicable to human translation. And why is that? First one, oh yeah, I cannot speak up. First, human translation is essentially document level and now, and well, in the recent research in quality, in machine translation quality estimation, they have come to this actually. They say, oh, machines have become so good that we might want to apply human standards of quality to them, right? Well, before that, they wouldn't do that. So now they're talking about document, looking at document level, and this is as a, as a translator, as an educator, as a, as a translation teacher, you would always tell your students <coughs> not to translate words or sentences, you translate texts, you do not translate sentences, right? And machine translation does exactly that, they translate sentences. Uh, this is one the, the paramount importance for me. Then, um, Human translation would be less, uh, would be more varied and less word for word, obviously, which means that the, the, the degrees, the shades of quality would be much more subtle and much more varied. Uh, types of errors, you would require much, many more types of errors to capture every, all the subtleties of human translation. Uh, Problems. While in machine translation, you can work with crude, bum, 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 very uh, emissions, substitutions, three, four types of, well, at least that was used to be the case, right? Then also, human translation is expected to be of publishable quality already. Well, for machine translation, nobody expects that. We're used not to expect that. Uh, for both types of translations, the reliability of uh, human annotation is kind of uh, a, a problem, but this is the same for both machines and humans, right? Then in human, this is, in human translation, you cannot access internal processes, like in machine translation, in Quest++, they access the brain of, of machine, translate, uh, machine translation engine, uh, and extract certainty of prediction and uh, use that for quality estimation. It's kind of, I don't know, uh, maybe eye tracking. And then, and this is also important. So for human translation and machine translation, quality estimation might want to focus on different aspects of quality. For human translation, I would argue on the next slide, that it's fluency, professionalism is, in human translation is about fluency. It is very rarely that humans um, intentionally corrupt the meaning of source text, right? Uh, content errors happen, but they are, they are less, popular, they're less frequent than language errors, right? And I will show in the next slide that it was proven by research. While in machine translation, they say fluency is getting better in neural machine translation, but accuracy that they can be parts of text is just missing, right? Well, you are, if you have any translation experience with translation, you would know that there are three aspects. Usually there are three aspects of translation quality, adequacy, which is fitness for com communicative purpose, accuracy, which is semantic similarity, how much content, and this is how it is operationalized in uh, annotation, how much of the meaning expressed in the source is also expressed in the topic, right? This is how they ask it. It's actually from, from I think, from a, from, a, from Graham. Uh, fluency or readability, how, uh, which usually ranges from flawless English or from flawless language, language to incomprehensible, like how how well it reads, right? And also there is undifferentiated approach, which is usually formulated like this. 
how much do you agree that the translation adequately, accurately, fluently, adequately, so it's kind of a, a neutral word which uh, incorpor incorporates both accuracy and fluency adequately expresses the meaning of the source text. How is this quality, uh, how is the quality benchmark? Real life assessment is we have, uh, a real life quality judgments is we have seen in this environment, right? And, and experimental setups. Experimental setups and both real life and experimental setups can, can uh, follow different, uh, can pursue different goals, like they can be summative, give me a number, or formative, why, is, why, why did I get this number again? <laughs> Explain why, what, what are my errors, why? Uh, and holistic versus analytical, a like holistic is a general, general description um, without giving, um, cat without going through rubrics or categories. And the methods used include three basic methods. Direct assessment, including ranking. Ranking is not, I do not consider ranking because that's a specific machine translation uh, thing. Group, analytical rubrics, errors and errors, three, right? Direct assessment. This is how it's, uh, what, what it usually looks like. It used to be being the uh, Likert scale options. Uh, more recently, they're using a slider so that you are not limited to a bin, but you can use a slider on a, on a one or from zero to a hundred points. Like how, how you feel about perceived quality? How do you feel about that? 78, no, 79%. Good, right? Uh, uh, then, um, and for direct assessment, for machine translation, this is what they want. This is what, what, what is recommended. I'm, I'm giving this because I use that for, uh, to undertake my human translation. I use this to undertake human translation, right? For use professionals, people who know about translation as an attaches. Because, like we said before, if, you, if you're a layman, if you know nothing about translations theoretically, it's likely that you would think that the text is higher quality than it, than it, it is, than it appears for professionals. But yeah, that's again. Does it mean that professionals have better judgment? If for and the end user it's an okay, Translation, well, I don't know. Evaluate documents. If you distinguish between fluency and accuracy, there should be separate setups for, uh, for, for accuracy and for fluency, or do not distinguish these two, right? So you cannot ask people to immediately assess both aspects because they would interfere. Uh, then, Well, I did not use this because I did not use any reference translation anyway, and and use original source texts for not translate not 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 reversed uh, parallel corpora as they used to to be doing before. This is a demonstration of rubrics, but I will skip that. This is just example of rubrics that are used for a certification in in the United States and in the UK. These are their rubrics. I did not use that, so. Uh, and error annotation typical. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, error, error taxonomy. Uh, my error taxonomy, the one that I'm using, is very similar to this one. And this one is adjustable, so. Right. Mm, binary categories. So I have, going back to my corpus, right? And my subset. So I have. Two, two types of binary labels. They have binary labels and scores. Two types of binary labels, two types of scores. Best, worst, as I described, and uh, professional variety. <coughs> I re-annotated re best, I re-annotated good, bad, uh, sub, uh, or a subset 
20%, I think, of good value, 40 triplets of uh, good value corpus. And my translate, my professor, well, my colleagues, teachers of university teachers of translation, agreed. Um, well, if you assess uh, Trippendorf's alpha, it's very low. But, and they were actually doing, they were predicting whether it, uh, whether it out of three texts, I gave them, uh, no wait, uh, yes, I gave them a source and two translations. They look at three texts, at triplets of three texts, and they have had to choose which one is good translation and which one is bad translation, or if they do not see the difference, they could choose the same, they don't see the difference, I don't see the difference. So they were actually do, uh, working as a machine uh, classifier, and they, in the end, if you discard eight disputable tri uh, triplets out of four hundred uh, out of forty, they would agree to ninety percent. So my translation teachers agreed to ninety percent accuracy that this is good and this is bad. It's kind of reliable, if you ask me. This is a good. <laughs> Data set. My good translations are really good and bad are really bad. Continuous scores come from error annotation and from direct assessment. Uh, for error annotation, I use their typical error annotation, like, like you have seen in the environment that you have seen. And uh, a sample was cross annotated by three experts, translation, by three translation teachers. And uh, I measured interrater reliability, inter 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 interrater agreement, inter interrater on a data agreement, a a interrater on a data agreement. But and here comes the caveats, right? Uh, here come the caveats that it, it applies this number, this Krippendorf's alpha applies only to top categories, top level categories, not all thirty categories. Top level categories marked in the same span. So when annotated is marked the same span and assigned the same category. So this is what I was looking at because the other, I don't know how to assess it otherwise. With, for this limited sample, there was an agreement, a reasonable agreement of Krippendorf's alpha 0 0.5, 0 0.6 is already good. I'm very close to very good. Uh, direct assessment, I, I, uh, I had 12 final year translation bachelor uh, degree students who studied translation professionally, final year, so they're in the fourth year of studying translation, like kind of professional people already, they have heard, they've, they've attended the lectures in translation studies, they've been in practical translation training, um, and um, we all, I did not, I did some, a few calibration sessions and I did not see how they can distinguish between, there were many um, disagreements, whether it's fluency or accuracy. And I decided against this disti distinguishing these two these aspects and I offered them an undistinct, um, a setup a, a set, a set which does not distinguish between accuracy and fluency, right? So we assessed um, adequacy, but they had the, this is something that is not even done for machine translation. They had the context of, the context of the whole text. They, they were encouraged to read the whole text first and then annotate sentences, sentence pairs using a slider. Bam, 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 bam. Results are very poor. The, uh, Alpha Krippendorf for the best triple. So out of 12 people, I selected three people who agreed between themselves most. And this most was point, uh, 0.3, Alpha Krippendorf. And also I tried to test validity in comparing validity to, uh, to error scores, right? So I had error scores for the same collection. And the correlation is very low. 0.2. So errors say <coughs> this is a bad translation. BA students say no, it's a good translation, or vice versa. This is how this is what I'm what, what I've got. Oh, this is the correlation. This is the correlation between uh, I think between 
even uh, yeah, uh, these are scores that were given in direct assessment, and these are error error based scores. This is how they correlate for for uh, for for three translated three most agreeing annotators and average for them. Uh huh. So you need a break, right? No, no. I wasn't going to ask for a break. That's going to ask a question. Um, I'm not, I just want to check that I'm not only, So the numbers on the previous slide didn't mean that much to me. So would it be right in understanding when BA students at the organization are asked to assess translations, they didn't agree with each other? So 12 people you might have. Yeah. They agreed to. Six, eight, good, yeah. Six, they, eight, good, bad. Yeah. But it was a great concern. The numbers basically all over the place. Yes. And what's the and that, that contrasts with the previous slide that we were talking about how translation teachers did agree with each other. Yeah. Well. So your point is the more experience you have as a translator, the more you sort of translate yeah. it's, it's, it's difficult to directly compare these results because yes. they were doing mm -hmm binary assessment, good, bad, it, like they were looking at the text, they were not, they were not um, writing a slider for each sentence. I think it's, it's wrong, now I think it's wrong to ask people to assess quality of sentence pairs, of translation of sentence pairs, even if you see the text as a, the, the context of the, of the whole text. Does translation, does human translation obtain on sentence level? But they needed sentence scores to apply uh, word embedding to sentence embeddings and uh, to try and uh, capture oh, uh, to try and detect sentence pairs that have errors probably right so if, uh, if there was if the error if translation error was found in in, in, a, in a specific sentence pair it should have a very low uh, score right on direct assessment well, the sentence above it would be like 100% good, right? And this one would be over 30% good. So this is where they, I probably would, would be able to capture that in well, ever well, weighting uh, the sentences somehow. Or, or, anyway, so I tried to get that. But I found that this is not a good setup. I mean, well, it, I mean, to, it's not a good setup for me, but it's very much in line with what you get in the industry, right? It's the same agreement that you see the even lower for in uh, workshop and machine translation experiments. They have zero uh, zero point two agreement, and they go with it, right? Also, the crimping of alpha in the previous slide, the crimping of alpha for my professional uh, teachers or on uh, the triplets was zero. If you calculate it properly, it's zero point three. Well, if you convert it into um, accuracy, like prediction accuracy, it's 90% after discarding the, the, the items that they disagreed on. Right? So this is, even reporting this agreement is kind of tricky. You can say this and you can avoid saying this. So I could, even, I could have given you only the accuracy after, after deleting the eight pairs, the eight triplets that were uh, disputable, right? My human, but if you, so, well, this is the problem. So my, one of my uh, uh, goals in this PhD, what I want to do is I want to see which of these labels correlate, are, are most predictable. Which of them a, a machine predicts better on any of the representations? And then I would say, well, given so much problems with error annotation, this type of label, quality score, quality label correlates with what is seen in the text best. This kind of, do you, do you see what I mean? So there are texts, right? there are, there are ling linguistic properties of the text, right? There are frequencies of items in text, right? And there is a number of scores assigned to this text in terms of quality. The A from Aaron, people said it's a good translation, 
um, and and it's a professional well, right? It's a limited relation that doesn't apply. So three, right? So for each text, I could, I could have um, for the for the eye in the for the brown small center in the eye, we have three labels. Which one correlates with actual text properties best? Well, of course, given your representation of text, how did you represent? How did you? Uh, convert this text into numerical values. That's another big, big issue for the for the next hour. <laughs> how do you convert? How do you convert texts? To, how do you label quality? And how do you represent texts to predict this label? We kind of covered how you benchmark quality and what problems are there. So in the next now we will have a ten minutes break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. 15 minutes, 15 minutes break, and we'll continue talking about features now, features and then um, the workflow for, for this kind of translation is prediction thing. Yeah, so 15 windows starts May, May. Uh, yeah, 25, uh, 25. I want to pause the recording, right? But let's go. And we are back. I think we are back in with recording. I, I in the break, I was telling those who were there to listen. <laughs> even more about uh, uh, a, tra a traditional approach to explaining uh, before we go to the machine learning setup. And one way to explain learner language uh, choices would be to analyze parallel corpus where the target side of the corpus is annotated for errors and look at the triggers in the source side if it's if the sentence aligned at the source side or which um, trigger well to the items in the source language that triggered that error right i complain that there is no software that can annotate that can help to annotate that and i had to do it manually so i asked those three colleagues of mine again, <laughs> to look in uh, to look at two thousand sentences annotated for errors and to typify the triggers, the source language side items that are associated with this error, with the annotated error. To get the taxonomy of those our source our language items, I look through translation textbooks that discuss issues and made a uh, and made a list the duplicated the list and got a list of like 60, <coughs> I think 60 most commonly discussed issues or source language issues that trigger translation that according to uh, translate uh, translation textbooks trigger or um, cause difficulties in translation in learning translation this is the list that I came up with as a result. It lists only top 20 most frequent triggers, top 20 most frequent. And if you rank those issues that are discussed in translation textbooks and get the top 20, the overlap would be only three items. So whatever is discussed, my, my conclusion is whatever is discussed in translation, uh, textbooks that target my uh, learners, I specifically uh, subset the textbooks that are addressed, that are that have my uh, like advanced translation students as target audience. So whatever they discuss, these textbooks discuss does not relate to what actually <laughs> triggers errors. This is the kind of, uh huh? Could it be um, included in that the books and some of the job? Essentially, like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I just, yeah. so that that's why they're not making it. That's very clever, that, yeah. And I discussed that in the paper that where I include this result. Yes, that's one explanation. 
that they can actually learn it. My learners actually have learned it. That's why they don't do those, they don't make those errors, but they do something else. That, that's a very good explanation. And then I, uh, I approach my colleagues and say, oh, you know what? We need to change our program. We need to teach this, not that. So, no. Because if we teach that, they will make errors there. No, we're not changing anything. <laughs> Uh, that's kind of wasted, right? But <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, but um, well, I have a, a well. It, it's, it's a long discussion, but yeah, it can be discussed. In uh, machine in machine translation uh, 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 area, quality is usually either quality is approached as either quality evaluation when they compare. Uh, a candidate translation to a reference translation and here reference is used in a different sense from what I use it usually right so reference reference for this sort of for, the, for this domain is another translation right usually human translation better quality translation and in my research I say uh, I use a reference to refer to non-translations, to originally also texts in the target language, which are not translation. And when I go to conferences where they discuss machine translation, there's usually a huge misunderstanding because of this. And I try to say non-translations, non-translations rather than reference to avoid this clash of terminology. But this is this is not applicable to human translation at all, right? No. Because we, as learners of translation, you would know that there, are, there can be two good very different translations, but both good translations to the same source, right? Good solutions uh, can be various, can be on a, can be different. They don't have to match anything. So what I'm left with is translation quality estimation. This is estimating translation quality without reference, without without comparing to anything to, to a better translation, to a good translation to anything. And in if well, I'm trying to steal ideas from machine translation um, domain, and they use used to use before uh, you know, 2016. They had feature engineering and engin uh, they engineered features like in Quest Plus Plus, and uh, after 2016, they mostly use our uh, embeddings, right? Those are the two major approaches that they use. And uh, also, they, uh, for machine translation, they evaluate quality on word level. <laughs> what word level? But it's error detection. So it can be it can be done for human translation if you are talking about error detection. Can I detect errors, right? Yeah. Well, right. So uh, translation is methodology. If we are talking about if, uh, so I'm trying to use translationist, translationist methodology for quality prediction, to predict human translation quality. Translationist studies, uh, well, yeah, this is the definition of translationist, right? <laughs> Properties of translations uh, <clears throat> that make them distinct from comparable non-translations, right? It, it's what, Usually there's all oh, right to choose this one like right okay. Translation is related natural language process and tasks include translation detection, source language detection. Given a translation, can you predict which language it's translated from? Easy, can be done. Because translation is mostly about interference, right? Um, 80, per, 80 to 90 percent accuracy, I think, even on the sentence level. But sentence level prediction would require word alignment, which for human translation is difficult. Uh, and translation direction detection, which is which is a modification of source language detection task. Usually, for a translationist methodology, you would need translations and non-translations. That's the minimum requirement. You need a, 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 the target, target text side of a parallel corpus, 
you don't necessarily need source language side, right? You can do, you compare target language to target language, that's all, right? And this is a very good case for, 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 for a corpus uh, study, right? You can test hypothesis is about translations properties. Do translations really overuse passives? Is there really more negative sentences in, in or fewer? Like it said, contra in contrastive linguistics, they say that Russian has uses non-translated Russian uses more negative sentences than English. So for English, it's less common to use negative sentences than for Russian, which means, which if you translate that into the, or if you project this into the you know, translational behavior, that would mean that translations would um, they use negation, right? They would, they would be fewer negative sentences in translated <coughs> Russian than in non-translated Russian. Does it make sense? This is how you generate hypothesis about translational behavior based on contrastive analysis, based on um, contrastive um, observations. But you need contrastive observations, right? And if you want contrast, contrastive observation, you need the source, you need the sentence aligned, or not sentence aligned, you need a source, uh, a, a corpus, a comparable corpus of source language too. Do you, is that true that Russian, that Russian uses more negative sentences? Is that really true? Okay. Uh, so, and also, uh, it is, It is required that uh, these corpora are registry comparable are the same are com you need to ensure that they they, they come that they represent the same register because registers would differ within one language registers can differ in terms of their lexical properties between themselves more than language independent on language independent features than text from different languages and I've seen that in my research so that there, there will be bigger distance between fiction in Russian and uh, academic text in Russian than between fiction in Russian and fiction in English so fiction fictional text in two different languages will be closer together in terms of distances than registers within one language so this is a very important that they compare that the, your reference is very comparable to and I spent half a year trying to uh, find a way to build a comparable corpus, but yeah. These are the methods that they usually use. Usually they use either univariate analysis, that is uh, uh, significance testing to detect translation is indicated. Say you have a number of features. Do they really distinguish translations from non-translations? Are these differences statistically significant? That's 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 a method, right? Or a multivariate analysis when they actually use text classification on a rain on a feature vector. This feature they used are in, um, and uh, an algorithm looks at patterns in all of the features, making it a multivariate analysis, right? And predict uh, the type of translation or the quality using all the, looking at all the features, at all the feature vectors, all the components of a feature vector. Well, also they use, except for supervised text classification approaches, they also use um, principal component analysis or uh, latent discriminant analysis, which are mildly su supervised or not Oscar clustering, which are not supervised approaches, but which uh, I also have the links to, I have a re extensive references in this slide and there's no links applicable and uh, there, there are papers that demonstrate how they use say hierarchical clustering to see which factor in, in has more influence on translation properties is it method of translation machines versus humans or register what is more what's more important what, what makes translations uh cluster better this or that one of the research done that. um 
And also feature selection is important. When you are achieve decent uh, accuracy of text classification, you can start deleting features and see whether the accuracy um, degrades a lot. Where you can and you can end up with say five. Uh, it's called a ablation study when you delete uh, gradually delete features and you uh, uh, retain few five features that are the best translation is predicted. That like say uh, on my sixty features I get uh, ninety two percent accuracy for translations versus non translations prediction right, but with five features out of sixty. I get 89% accuracy. So probably these five features are the best predictors of translation is, right? This is how, this is the logic behind this sort of research. Uh, translation is indicators derived from an, a late 90s uh, theory of translation universals originally formulated in a rigorous way by Mona Baker. And originally, translation is universals uh, were thought to be features of translations that are not associated with language pair, that are not uh, induced by source language, that are not the result of source language or target language system influence. This is uh, explicitation would be a good example, probably, right? With uh, translators, with being in a situation of translation, people uh, tend to make, have the uh, urge <laughs> to cognitive, an uh, urge to make text clearer, better structured, more readable, this sort of thing. Uh, well, uh, so. This feature is, well, you, sometimes translation is universals, and universal, the word universal uh, implies that these features are cut across all language pairs, all registers, all types of translation. This is inherently translational thing. So whenever it's a translation, it, it, it exhibits this kind of <coughs> trend, tendency. It's difficult to prove because it's impossible to test for all those conditions, right? So they started, they stopped talking about universals anymore. They say about trans, trans tendencies, this is the most current uh, term. And uh, translational tendencies and trends are, uh, are revealed through quantitative analysis. They describe and, and explain linguistic specificity of translations and typify, make translations, uh, explain why translations are a target language subsystem. Typical translationist tendencies, translational tendencies are interference or shining through, uh, which is, for me, it most, uh, they're mostly um, manifested in frequency counts when uh, mm, some items of the target language feature unusually low or unusually high frequencies. Like we have discussed a few examples already like passives or like uh, negative constructions. Uh, also strange, strange strings uh, of something like Heavy criticism, if you translate heavy criticism directly into, into Russian at least, that would be a strange string. Heavy criticism, how is it heavy? It's strong, right? Or is it strong or heavy? Both in, in English. Oh, heavy criticism. No. It's heavy. Yeah. heavy criticism. The, yeah. both, yeah. but I think heavy is probably more common. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I usually check that with the corpora because I, I will never trust my <laughs> understanding of English because that's like. Oh, don't trust me. No, no, yeah, right. Heavily <laughs> criticized. Heavily criticized. Oh, right, heavily criticized. Mm, you can also say strong. You can say that. Heavily, that's when you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heavily. 
in Russia, you wouldn't say that. But I, th I think it's, it depends what it, it's an adverb or adjective, right? Because I would say, yeah, we heavily criticize, but then if I was using criticism, then that I would you say strongly say heavy criticism. You wouldn't say heavy criticism, right? No. I mean, then Ooh, it's a condition, so right? It's, like, uh, it's, a con it's a construction from uh, this week's uh, lecture by you. Or, or for us, if you've attended the lecture by Gloria, uh, last week, yeah, last week. Oh, last week, yeah, right, yeah, it's, it's a construction, then, right? This is a good, this is a good uh, example of a construction when the choice of a lexeme depends on the um, structure, right? Or you, like you can say, uh, it is not surprising that blah blah blah. Right? But you cannot say it's not amazing that. <laughs> it's not amazing that. That would be also a limited uh, variability of lexeme in that particular structure. It's not surprising that. It's not amazing that. No, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, explicitation is spelling things out. Probably it's, uh, it's the, the name of it is the. Uh, is already descriptive. Yeah, yeah this is this is when the, the unpacking non-finite clauses into finite clauses. All uh, source text pronouns analysis would develop into full noun phrases, which would lead to uh, higher uh, higher frequency of nouns. In verbal, well, in as subjects and objects, right? Because they would replace pronouns with nouns, noun phrases. And uh, more frequent use of connectives, then leveling, uh, leveling out translations are more homogeneous and less creative than source texts, reducing multiple voices, reducing figurative or speech, reducing uh, geographical dialects, or territorial dialects, the topical. That, that, that topical dialects, right? So that's lengthening translations are longer, and uh, simplification, a normalization, and unique items hypothesis. That if you can think of an of a of an item which is unique for your target language, which does it does not exist in the source language. You can almost always predict that it would be underused, right? Yeah, because they would be, it, it would not be prompted by the source language and the translators would forget about it. Uh, normalization is, for me, it's a teddy base, it's like a, a lexical teddy base where translation, translators uh, overuse the most typical um, Equivalent for an item, for example, however, in the, the immediate the association would be Admaka in Russian. And then and although there are other ways of expressing that, Procha, for example, which are frequently very frequent in the non-translated non Russian, but Procha never appears in translations, but Admaka would uh, be overused while Procha would be underused. This is this is the this is the normalization uh, effect. And simplification is a lexical level, it's less like a very vocabulary, higher readability scores. I would check that. I'm not sure. Do you? What's your hunch? Would translations be more readable or less readable than non translation? Comparable non translations, comparable non translations, professional written non translation. More readable. Yeah, because of professional. Yeah, professional yeah. translations would be more readable. Yeah. You have worked as a translator. Yeah, yeah, I should have specified which translation because I've had all, all my life I've worked with learning translations, and when I see this higher to do this, I'm like, no, 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 no. Translations are not readable, but that's because I'm, I have this distortion, professional distortion, because deformation, because I've only worked with translations that are usually learned translations, right? But probably, yeah, probably professional translations are must be better. High. Well, this is what they say in the in translation is studies, right? I think it's, it's a really interesting one. Like, um, I mean, 
thinking about it quite a lot recently. Um, I think it's very domain specific. And so I work in a, um, I'm a Japanese to English translator, and I've been working for about 10 years in the IT sector. So it's internal communications in the company. Right? And I feel like this is a kind of translation that doesn't really get talked about in the, in the literature a lot. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, they tend to be thinking about literature or mass religious media. texts yeah. or mass media, uh, which are originally written by professional writers. So you'd yeah. expect a source text to have a very high quality. Whereas the stuff I translate is written by, you know, developers, engineers, whatever, they're, they're not like, yeah. their yeah. quality of writing is not often not high at all. You know, oh, wow, your wow. job as a translator is deciphering what they said in the first place. Oh, this is a really it's, hard topic. So I think in, in, that, in that context, the, yeah, you know, the translators, the translations are better quality than the source text. Then compare the source text because translators are. Yeah, but you're a starting wall. You're a starting wall, right? You're saying that your source texts are, are already not up to the standard, right? Right. But yeah. In that domain, in that genre, it's. Yeah. They say that, yeah, yeah. That <laughs> about elevating uh, function of translation, they say that uh, Robert Shaw was very liked in the Western world because he was such a. Fluent speaker, orator. And inside the country, we thought, oh my god, he cannot speak at all. He <laughs> <laughs> was the poorest speaker ever. And when, when it's like, how is he a good orator at all? But that's because of the interpreter, who could always speak through an interpreter. Yeah, yeah. Get yourself a good interpreter, and you'll be famed as a good speaker. Yeah. <laughs> in the foreign language, right? <laughs> That's an idea. Uh, and it clashes with the domestic perception. Okay. Um, so why use the ski, ski slide? All right. Why use to, and then we can skip from here, we can skip the results. Oh, no features, right? <laughs> Uh, why use translation is for translation quality estimation. In univariate analysis, when comparing learners, professionals, and non-translations, I'm always on all features. I always find trans uh, professionals on the climb between the two extremes. So learners are always in my collection. Learners are always the, the uh, one uh, side end of continuum. <coughs> non-translations are the other end of continuum. And <laughs> and depending on the feature, professionals are like mm, closer here, so, so they're always in between, kind of indicative. Then translation is quality link is implied in these publications and all these publications for for this or that reason. Then human professionalism is about um, fluency as established by Carl, uh, Michael Carr. Uh, students make more fluency areas than professionals, but there's no significant differences in, in, in the number of content errors. The, the content errors are there, but in both collections, but there's no significant difference between the two. Uh, then, um, if we think about it, translation is only captures fluency, right? Translation is about, it compares to the uh, expected value of language. No, it's only about fluency. It, it does not talk about accuracy. But my hunch is, first, there is no, uh, there are, there, the distinctions between fluency and accuracy is uh, very fuzzy. So human uh, annotators find it difficult to distinguish the two. This is the publication. And also, I, from my personal experience, if a text is poorly written, it's likely that it, it oh, say, oh, vice versa. I can hardly imagine a text which is flawless in terms of, in terms of readability and fluency, but has it all wrong in terms of content. That's kind of a real unicorn situation, right? So it's a constructed reality where uh, a text would be meticulously or betrayed in a very fluent translation. 
that would require a skill to do that. Usually when uh, a content error is made, it sends ripples across the text, which makes the text read weird, or sends you this eerie feeling there's something wrong with it, right? And it's an indicator of content error, can be an indicator of content error, a giveaway of content error. Okay. Approaches, so what is used to capture translation is? Three types of uh, approaches. First, count-based features such as frequencies of individual items, like relative that. Let's go. Let's count relative that in this con in certain type of context, like uh, that. Not that book, but uh, this is the uh, this is the house that Jack that Jack built, right? Relative uh, then cumulative frequencies of listed items. Say you compile a list of connectives and you count cumulative frequencies of all the listed items for the text, normalized to text size, to text lengths. Then frequencies of post tags, not necessarily lexical items, but uh, for case studies, but post tags, syntactic dependencies, combinations. Well, then another approach with I, uh, which I also referred to count based features is character and word engrams. This is a very popular approach, <clears throat> but I, as I said, it's the this is surface representations, and uh, it is not particularly interesting linguistically for interpretation. Right? It's good for solving a task if you need to professionally in in, in an industry you need to detect the translation from non-translation. Okay, that's that's an approach. But if you want to know in something or anything about translations and translational specificity, then. Uh, then uh, uh, calculated features, complex calculated features, such as ratios, lexical variety, dense, lexical density, average senses per word, per, per, per word average syllables, the sentence depths, or mean hierarchical distance for a sentence, averaged across texts, or uh, across all sentences in a text, Reading scores, entropy. Recently, they started using from 2018. They started using uh, entropy scores from language models uh, on the assumption that if the translate, if a translation does not read well, so the language models should have higher entropy scores, perplexity scores, right, from language modeling. And the third approach is embedding spaces naturally. So they, what, what they do in translation studies is they represent the text, delixicalize it, make it, produce a delixicalized representation of the text. Say, so replace each word with a post tag, learn an embedding space on that, and use these features for, for, for experiments. The most uh, reputable uh, feature set which is used in many translation studies is uh, produced in 2015 uh, by Greg Volansky. And well, this is used as a benchmark. And also Quest Plus, uh, Quest, uh, Quest Plus Plus 17 or 77 uh, document level features is also available. It's difficult to generate that, that I do not recommend. What is what are the desired properties if you think of the hand engineering features? Then they should be motivated, well motivated theoretically from contrastive studies, for example, right? Or from no or from your hunches about translations, property of translations, or uh, or again contrastive studies, right? I, I rely on contrastive studies usually. Or from what's suggested in translation textbooks, also a good approach, right? They say that students make errors here. They say that students overuse that. Or, or in translation, there's a tendency to overuse that. Is that true? Uh, and interpretable, right? And content independent again, right? I cannot, I would stress it again. Reasonably frequent, right? You, want it, you don't want a very rare feature because it could give you anything to work with. Reliably extractable, and well, this is what people fall back to. They want you robust feature sets that would work for any language pair, which I don't believe in. But this is what people do: they produce language independent language independent features, which do not necessarily are optimal solutions for 
all language barriers. Over the years, I've developed my uh, feature set of translation is indicators that work for English Russian in that direction only. Then I applied, tried to apply it to other language pairs and it failed miserably. So, in my research, I'm using, I use features that are first not well known indicators and um, based on expect. Uh, Yeah, uh, expectations are in brackets. That's the expectations of translations. So, what is these features? This, uh, these are examples of features that are reported in many studies on many language pairs for many genre or registers. And uh, it's a shame not to include them in your feature set because they work for most cases. So, so it's like lexical uh, uh, type token uh, ratios is expected to be lower in translations. Right, lexical density expected to be lower in translations. Overuse of discourse markers, more discourse markers in translations. Sentence lengths higher everywhere, and overuse of pronouns. So, if you are thinking about a quick study, you might consider this. And if you have translations and non-translations, you can uh, extract this in EntConc and demonstrate that this is true for your corpus or for your uh, language pair, right? Then I also use uh, patterns that are expected for specifically for English Russian translation from contrastive studies. And also, and, and these, uh, these features are ex extracted from universal dependencies in a past trees from an LLU format. If, you, if you're familiar with Pass the coinal coinal new format when uh, you have one word per line and uh, the column it, it, there are eight columns and each column has a part of speech lemma uh, grammatical categories list of grammatical categories such as such as singular um, case. Uh, grammatical categories, right? And then, uh, then there is a column with uh, syntactic function of this word in a sentence. This is called a coin and new format. I pass my uh, texts and extract features from uh, universal dependencies, tags for well, for various things. And then, then I also use lexical features, but not surface lexical features, abstract lexical features, such as ratios of n-grams of unigram, bigram, and trigram from the bottom and top uh, well, from the top and bottom quartiles to trying to capture lang uh, language varieties trying to capture on a big scale the overuse of however of the immediate uh, uh, equivalent of, of english however in russian so um, items from top frequency quartile would be even more used, while items from the low frequency quartiles in translations would be underused. This is what I expect to capture. And perplexity language, uh, language model, and gram language model perplexity. Also, and I also use, and I have not, I haven't tried, I don't have the results of this yet, but I'm, I'm using collocation of um, features, abstract collocation of features like ratios, not matching strings, but ratios, ratios of uh, collocations um, above a certain association threshold, trying to capture those uh, uh, heavily criticized or strongly criticized uh, mismatching strings that are strange strings, right? Or also, uh, they say that in translations, uh, uh, according to Anthony Pim, translations uh, translators prefer to fall back to reliable, um, recognizable or options. They hedge against creativity on the grounds that it might be risky to be creative. So creativity always comes at a, with a certain degree of risk. And in translation, you might want to avoid that, says Anthony Pim. In his explanation of why that happens. This is, I would not bore you with the list of uh, uh, groups of features, but 
the different right the, the synthetic functions universal relations morphological categories uh 58 frequency features results good results <laughs> after you spend so much time the result are a bit disappointing <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> An says this is good results. This is these results are it's like well, what did what do you want? Like I want 0 0.8. I want 80 percent because from my perspective, my my human annotate is on binary uh, uh, so, uh, collection. Agree to 90 percent. If people agree to 90 percent, why a machine agrees to? 63%, 64%. Student service professionals is better, 73% accuracy. So uh, it's easier to predict our professional level than uh, uh, good, bad quality. That's what I've got. These are old results. I tried to produce new ones, but I didn't have the time if I had this lecture in a week's time, I would, I would have, I would report new results. Maybe they will change because I'm refining the corpora. I'm verifying. I'm, I'm using a different feature set. I'm using different extraction. I refuse to admit that these labels are unlearnable. I think there's a, uh, this results is uh, because I have well, lame representations or an error somewhere or something. Well, I don't know. Mm, these results were before I deleted those eight pairs. So kind of maybe that would help. Then quest plus plus gives me even worse results for uh, for binary labels. And uh, continuous scores for document level is not uh, well but this is this is not accuracy, is it? this is Pearson correlations, and for Pearson correlation. If you look at what's in the field, uh, what, what they report for comparable experiments, it's about the same. So people, uh, when people predict continuous scores, they usually report 0 0.5, 0 0.6 PS uh, PS and raw value. So it's kind of what's what's in the field, right? What you would expect in the field. Oh, that this is the previous research. So um, there are two research, uh, th there are two projects that do similar things that I try to do. Unlo uh, unfortunately, both of them are based on the languages that are, do not, are not, with the language distance, which is way greater than between Russian and English. Ch Japanese to English and Chinese, in English to Chinese. <laughs> this is all I've got. And also, uh, this one is not reliable to it's a PhD project uh, finished in 2018. And he reports uh, document level uh, Pearson correlation for continuous scores at 0 0.7, which is like, whoop, a lot. And I'm like, why? How did, how does it get it? He's not, he's not using anything clever in terms of features. He's using uh, the surface features, the typical word, word, word embeddings, not even sentence embeddings, but the previous generation of um, word embeddings. Why does he why does he get these results? This is because he's, he's, if you look at his data, he uses six sources, source, six English texts, and three thousand. 3,500 translations to the six sources. So these are very multiple translations, very repetitive. And he's not, and he does our cross validation without accounting for this, uh, for this fact, which means that his model trains on some translations to the same text and tests on other translations to the same text, which is cheating, <laughs> which is not good practice. So he should have trained on four texts, on translations to four texts or five texts, right? 
and test on the, on the other one. That would be fair. That is that is called group for group group fold cross validation. Group a group cut fold cross validation. So if you if you if you chunk books into to get more observations, people sometimes chunk texts, right? So they have a, a war and peace from Vital Stoy, chunk it in the southern uh, sub texts, right? And then train on that. But you need to ensure that all of them all of them go into train or all of them go into test. You cannot afford to have chunks from the same source be both in train and in test. Because text from the same chunks from the same source would have a similarity and the model would easily to give away. Also, if you compare, uh, if you look at the results for the same language pair for machine translation for, 2000 to, for the year 2000, you would have zero correlation of 0 0.5, like I said. So my, res my result is 0 0.48, but it's like the same. And I wouldn't even comment on the second one. Same, same. I mean, uh, I mean, it's the same result. I'm just going, uh, showing the figure, the number, right? But I expected for my language there, I expected 0 0.7. That's what my expectations were. I used distributional models for accuracy and fluency. I, uh, for accuracy, I learned uh, using Muse project, I learned uh, multilingual embeddings uh, on lampus on on lemmatized corpora specifically to do uh, to for this project. Uh, and uh, I represented source texts and target texts and measured cosine similarity, and used the cosine similarity score to predict quality, uh, thinking that maybe. Those bad, good uh, labels are more related to, to, to similarity between source and target, not to fluency. Yeah. And flu or, or I tried fluency, tried a uh, fluency approach when I compare when I represented translations and oh no, when I, I used perplexity here, so I trained um, extracted perplexity for bad translation and good translation from a model learned and comparable. Mass media, big, huge, uh, huge mass media corpus, land post. Well, this is the results from alternative representations. If you would recall the previous results, I think this is the best. This is the best I see because the, the, on the previous slide we had 60, uh, what is it? 63, right? 63. And now I have 63. <laughs> but this is not on anything fancy. This is on TF idea. Character engrams. So it is only uh, summative. It, it it is not explanatory at all. It's like okay. you cannot explain that. I mean, well, you can, and I've seen uh, people trying to explain those engrams, but this is not what I expected. Continuous scores are not even better. Okay, done. I hope to re, re I hope to rerun and get better results on other representations. I'm trying. I'm, I'm working on including. I actually so I so worked hard to include new results here, but today because it, it's such a nice opportunity to, to talk through new results, but it didn't happen. Sorry. Uh, so uh, I'm going. I'm using Bird now. I try. Um, I will try to throw in error annotation, uh, vectorized error annotation, and throw it in into um, neural architecture. Uh, I'm trying new or abstract lexical features based on collocations. I don't have my hopes high, but I will try it. Right? I'll report it. And a wide range of indicators that was used in for those results. Yeah, well, data refinement, better representation. I don't believe, like, <laughs> I was impressed when, uh, with uh, Antoine Lavoisier um, experiments with in the end of 18th century, end of 18th century, before French Revolution, 
He was way, waiting, waiting, waiting on scales, molecules of oxygen, nitrogen in the air. And I cannot capture the difference between good and bad. No. <laughs> That's my motivation, all right? If I'm honest, the guy executed in French Revolution was waiting molecules, no technology at all, and with uh, neural, all the neural architecture. Yeah. yeah, I should be able to do that. In the last ooh, 40 minutes, I will walk out. Oh, we need a break, right? How about a break? Uh, all right. Uh, well, we have recorded 10 minutes of our, of break, but that's okay. We had interesting conversations, if you can make out <laughs> what people were saying. I hope nobody's embarrassed. Uh, okay, I'm going back to my uh, final part. Luckily, we have just half an hour, and I hope... I will be able to explain the workflow for a translation is study. Ideally, I wanted to, or initially, I wanted to give a recipe that would be plug and play with um, end concept. But that, that would play too much time and effort, especially that I do not use Antifonk anymore, and I would have to relearn it, and we would have to, just for the sake of demonstration, we have to. So I decided instead of that, and then I tried to, sim I tried to simplify some of uh, the scripts that I'm using to still make it plug and play, to uh, clone my repository. Everything's there, uh, all the, our, our, a small baby corpus, toy corpus, and uh, the, the outputs and the inputs and everything. So that can be used, but it would require a lot of adaptation to any project if you're using it. So I decided my purpose in the last part of this session is to just explain the workflow of what is what steps are required and how they can be accomplished, how they can be complete uh, to do a translation in study. And a translation in study is comparing translations to non-translations, maybe occasionally comparing to source texts too, if you have, if you have a, 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 a doc, at least document alignment. Ideally, you want sentence alignment. Because in my collection, I've just discovered they would be, especially with learners, learners would translate part of the text only. So you would have, I would, I would have document alignment, but no sentence alignment. So the target text would be 20 sentences and source text would be 40 sentences because they did not translate part of it. And I overlooked that. So ideally to ensure your results, you might want to double check whether your parallel documents are sentence level aligned, or at least what I do, I check, or I think it's a step. It's a step already. Yeah, check parallel over here. So first, the first, there are three, I think it's three steps. No, let's see, let's see. Corpus design, numerical representation, analysis and explanation. Corpus design. I use uh, also another caveat that I wanted to uh, make is that I have no doubt that other people would do that in a different way, but I'm sharing my experience. I'm, 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 I'm explaining what I do. Maybe other people do it otherwise, some, in other way. But I collaborated with many people, with several people on this sort of project. Nobody objected, so it's kind of <laughs> it works. Uh, right. And also, I, oh, when I started learning about programming, I wish I heard more people sharing their experience instead of telling me, go and use your favorite embedding 
framework. Right? I don't have a favorite embedding framework. What, what's what now? Yes. <laughs> and this is what they say, right? So, uh, and they say to uh, hedge against uh, criticism that it can be done otherwise, right? Yes, I admit from the onset this can be done otherwise, but this is how I do it, right? <laughs> and I think sharing, explaining what, how you do things can be enlightening, and I wish more people did that instead of just saying, do it. Do it how? Right? Do it how? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So I uh, first step is uh, to get a structured corpus, structured annotated corpus like this. So you need a folder with with some folders that are named with, uh, with that are named with your categories because it's easier than to uh, work with the pass as a type of as a category. So uh, I would have a txt folder for, for say debates and fiction at the top level at the top uh, level of hierarchy. Then in debates and in fiction, you would have reference, non-translations, sources and targets. Oops. And exactly the same. Yeah, so you, you, so just past corpus is here, right? So you can imagine that this is the uh, raw txt format, and then you pass it and get a double, and get a version version of the same corpus, but only past with in coinal U format or in lemma format, lemma file format, <coughs> or in um, in say lambos format. I use three formats, four, three formats. TXT for embeddings, uh, coordinate you format, past format for universal dependencies. Lemmas, uh, lempos. This is when each word in corpus is replaced with lemma underscore post tag for generating n ground models. And I use lemmas, words replaced with lemmas with all proper names deleted and all numbers deleted or replaced with X's. Like three, five, all, all numbers, all, all our numbers are replaced because they are not, they do not make sense. And I use that for collocational features. To get, how do you get this um, structure? Where you can use this, uh, uh, where you can get the text. Sources of texts. <laughs> I would advise reusing an existing corpus, and there's a very good, very usable uh, uh, version of Europol. Well, it's one register only. It's downloadable, it, it has many languages, uh, language pairs, and it has reference. The problem with this sort of research is that you need a comparable reference, and it's difficult to obtain. Uh, my master's student working in English Spanish language pair, very big languages, was only able in a year and a half, was only able to get two registries, which is debates and uh, debates and fiction. Because it's mostly uh, it's because we needed uh, document aligned and sentence aligned uh, for collections and reference. So we can use uh, news commentary, for example, right? But we don't have access to mass media, non-translated Spanish text. If you know where to get one, we will be happy to use your advice. But she says, no. I managed to get it from new seller. I managed even to get new seller, but I cannot use it because uh, yeah, I cannot use it. Yeah, so getting, and in this, in Europol, in Europol, um, so we, we kind of have a problem with getting ref, a comparable reference. In Europol, it, a, compar a comparable reference is already there. Bum. So it, it has three uh, text types, 
um, in the same corpus because it's specifically done for translation in studies. Then um, you can extract if you if you are if you have reference corpus and you have a parallel corpus. The, the parallel corpus, the chances are that parallel corpuses would come in a, an XML format or its variety TMX. So you need to extract from, usually you need to extract from a TMX or XML format. These are the scripts. These are, I think it should, it, it's linky, it should be linky. It does not click because I'm sharing the screen, but it does work if you, I'm not sharing the screen. So uh, it, it is a link to my scripts that extract TXT from B and C, for example, because B and C's word level has word level uh, XML tags around each word. And I honestly, I did not find um, an easy to play way to extract an available way, so I had to produce my own. So the, the, the BNC corpus is available, but it's XML format. You cannot use it in, in EndConc or anywhere. Is this the new version? The, that's the latest, uh, latest for 2020. I don't know. Yeah. I downloaded 2020 and I had to write a script to extract TXT from it. I was shocked. Well, Maybe well, if you. Well, it's not available to the public, right? It is. Yeah. All of it. BSC. No, no, no. It's it, one but problem. You, do you think it, yeah, like you say, you think it should be. It is. Yeah. The written BSC. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's all available. Okay. But it's in XML format, which may, and it's word level XML format. So each word, each word is on one, uh, it's 100 million, is it? Right. 100 million words, right? Each one of 100 million words is wrapped in, in an XML tag. So to restore the structure, you need to pass this XML. And the, the problem with it, oh, it's the problem with the Russian, same with the Russian national corpus. So I have a well, problem you're not interested in. I have, uh, the Russian national corpus have parallel subcorpora for 20 languages, but the other language is Russian. So if you're interested in, if you're interested in your language versus Russian, either a source or target, I have the, uh, the, the parallel corpora, the small parallel corpora for, well, reasonably big parallel corpora for 20 languages from Russian national corpus. And it's also XML format, but I have a script that extracts it to TXT. So it's plug and play, bum bum. Then uh, this is a script that extracts from TMX. And extracting from TMX, TMX is a parallel corpus format, right? Problem with TMX extraction is that TMX does not guarantee the order of sentences in a text. It is not, uh, it is not designed, it's like a dictionary in Python. It is not designed to keep the order. So when you extract from TMX, you cannot guarantee that the sentences appear in the same order as they were in the, te in the uh, text files that were used to produce this TMX. Um, uh, it, I was very upset. Huh? What kind of TMX? What, what's the source of the TMX files? How do you produce TMX files? How do you produce? All right, you, 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 you get a translation yeah. memory, right? So that's not my way. Yeah. My way is to call BBC News, uh -huh. to BBC Russian service, for example, and expect text from links. So there are many sites that have English and um, other languages, right? Which have the same content. You might want to crawl that and the line. This is what I did with, with uh, BBC which uh, publishes translations, Russian translations of English uh, articles available online with a link. So they say, or Inasmi, the same as uh, with Inasmi. This is a translation, this is the link to original. You write a crawler, this is, uh, this is the crawler. You give, uh, you pass list of links to the crawler, it gets texts. You have a TXT collection, same name, 
equipon equiponimus. No, that's a difficult word. Equi e e e equi yeah, yeah, same same name. There's a fancy word. Ah. Egg, uh, uh, like name the same. Yeah, name the same. Is it egg? Yeah. No, I said a weird one. I learned it, but I don't know. So same name texts, and you need to align them. The sentence align them. I use the left aligner for that. You can use a uh, made cut or other your favorite. Cut tool. <laughs> I use a left aligner. I use a left aligner, and this uh, this uh, it, it is a link. It is a linky content, right? It's Cyan is linky content, and and also you can Google Translate. So for your project, uh, for the end of the semester, you can have if you are desperate, you want want to do uh, to to explore translations, right? And you have our some text that you want to look into. You can translate them with Google Translate, and you don't have to copy paste, you can use an ADR, which is like, give it a list of texts, and it, and it, and it translates and stores in a separate folder all your translation. This is how, this is a script which does that. Uh, okay, so you have, uh, you, you have an, an aligned uh, TMX, you extract it into TXT, you have, you have this, Kind of, you ended up here, right? So you have a TXT uh, structured corpus with these names reflecting your categories that you're going to explore. Reference versus targets. This is translation is classification, right? Then um, sources versus reference. This is language gap. Contrasting differences between the two languages because this is these are non translations and these are non translations, right? Uh, and sources versus targets. Is that true that this feature that is overused in translations comes from sources? Um, then, uh, then uh, building this structured corpus, to, you, we want to refine it. And I found it very important to normalize document size. You don't want some text to be three sentences long and some text to be 300 sentences long, right? You don't want that. You want a standard deviation about the same for document sizes, that one thing. And sentence lengths, this is even more important. If, if you're using somebody else's corpora, you might want to check that your sentence length is within some parameters. There are no outliers. I, del I delete from all my corpora, I delete 5% outliers on both parameters, just to be sure. If you don't do that, you would end up with uh, texts that are that unfairly tilt your balance to um, that are not reliable. The results would not be too reliable, and it's clear from visualizations. So in visualizations, you would see these outliers, and you would have to go back and delete them in the end. So it's better to do it from the beginning. Check parallelism. That's what I didn't do. <laughs> I had to run all the again because I found that some. Some students did not translate all the text. Check parallelism. There's a script in this repository that checks parallelism too. And do its outliers too. And then annotate, and this is the uh, this is a way to annotate it, it the top of in the top of the script there's an explanation of how to use the script, what you need with what you need to install and what you need to do to, to annotate. Then features. Second step, so okay, you've got the corpus, you've annotated it, uh, it, is, it is a structured corpus, it's a folder structured, uh, structured, it's a structured folder, right? Then you need to produce a table, you need to do numerical representation, you need to convert your text into numbers, into strings of numbers, vectors of numbers. Ideally, I end up with all my texts from all folders, on, uh, as rows and all my features and metadata and uh, information from the folder names uh, in the columns, right? Plus, features plus metadata here. So, how which features? How do you, which features to use? What what is the approach usually? Usually, 
Usually you would have a hypothesis. I've mentioned a few already, right, today. What, what you want to test. You can use univariate analysis. You can, use, you can focus on one feature, uh, like frequency rank changes we discussed, right? That's one feature, it's good. Uh, the, this research from 2015 from Vera Balonsky, she uses 30, 32 translationist indicators in univariate analysis, right? So for each feature, she does classification, that's all. So you can use one feature and do or classification uh, for that. Uh, then you, some people <laughs> throw a wide net, so they operationalize as much as like they throw in everything they can extract reliably, regardless whether it makes sense or it doesn't make sense, right? Uh, neural, uh, neural architectures or support vector machines even does not care about the width of your table. So the machine, some machine translation algorithms do not, um, it's a rule of the thumb that your, that your table should be 10 times longer than it is wide, right? For, for Kanye's neighbors, for other algorithms. But it's not the same, it's not true for support vector machines. Support vector machines doesn't care. And neural architecture do not care. So you can use 100 texts and 5,000 features, <laughs> no problem, right? So and this, is, uh, this is what ARM says too. Like when I like say, mm, I don't want to concatenate uh, vectors, I will end up with 10,000 features, right? For my 300 texts. That's not a problem, according to him. And I've seen that done too. And I checked with, uh, it, it is not good for some algorithms, but not others. I checked with Stephen Everett. She says that support vector machines is not sensible to that, so it can be used. That's why it is used extensively for this sort of um, analysis. Right. So uh, the problem with this is that you hope that you will stumble upon something interesting, because something would be really wow, a, a find that you didn't expect, and second, that you'll be able to interpret it. I, I struggle with this, honestly. So if I if, if I don't know from onset with what this feature indicates and what I expect, but this is why I edit uh, expectations. So I expect this to be lower, this to be higher in translation. This, I, I expect it from my theoretical understanding of translations and contrastive relations between the two languages, right? If you do not expect anything for a feature, Well, I don't know how to, well, I struggle with that. I don't know. I'm like, so what? Okay. Uh, that, this is what is being popular, and I fell victim of the desire to use all these sexy new uh, <laughs> representations. They work well. They work, they, they classify everything to, uh, the translation is classification is like 99, 99% accuracy, 99.9% accuracy. But these are string features again, so they're working with mostly surface. Okay, so okay, I'm able to solve an NLP task. How is it constructed? So what do I learn from it? Okay. I don't see much use in that, but it's good as a baseline. That's what I'm. But how is it? Baseline is usually something that you outperform. How can you outperform 99.9% accuracy? So this sort of research is not about outperforming your baseline. <laughs> so why use this baseline at all? I don't know. <clears throat> okay, and then universe finally. Univariate analysis or and machine translation algorithm. So, so these are the types of analysis that I usually do. Significant first, significance tests whether the feature is really or the, the differences in frequencies that you see in two categories are significant, and also they insist that you report 
effect size, co and D for effect size, with big uh, collections of data, you would always have significant, significant differences between counts. But is the effect size big? Is the differences like, is the, this difference is really important? So they report significant sense plus effect size, coin D. I report coin D. And I usually, I do not use a student test, but I use Wilkerson test, test because my data and language data is usually not normally distributed. Uh, then, uh, then I compare frequencies in sources, targets, and non-translations to like, like here, like this. In different registers, my targets, the top uh, axis of the triangle is targets. The left, right side is sources and uh, left side is reference. So the target is between, for mass media, for popular science, the target is between the reference and the source text. And a bit up, the elevation of the app, uh, axis in this um, representation demonstrates uh, how much non-interference translation is there. So if my axis, if my this axis was on, on like was on this line, it would mean that it's all translation is, is about interference. It's all just interference. The elevation of the axis shows the amount of um, translation is which is not related to source text and target text. This is news commentary has a lot of it. So there are. Uh, there is explicitation, something, decisions that cannot be explained by the two languages. And for fiction, targets are here, so targets overshoot, it's over normalization. This is, this is expected, and targets are like super Russian, very Russian, very, they over, overdo uh, what's typical for Russian, and they're, they're away from sources. This is what, what's obtained by comparing frequencies between the three categories. So you position your targets between the three or uh, average frequencies for each feature. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. Clustering visualizations like this are good. And, 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 and then, and finally, and finally you would explain it. Explaining. How do you explain it? You explain it. Uh, if you if you had previous hypotheses, you would say, yeah, that's true. That's true what they say in translation textbooks. Yeah, that's true what they say, what I expected from my trusted analysis, or not true. Right? So you can uh, refute or support your hypothesis. This is from my trusted study. If you, you can also try and explain the observed differences from uh, so sociocultural or ethical norms, like I tried to refer to Anthony Pym's uh, risk minimizing strategies, uh, or also language prestige. Uh, uh, Stefan Ebert found that there's more translationese when translating from English to German than from German to English. And he explained it, let me check. He explained it with language prestige. He said that it's kind of more uh, translation is more tolerated when translating from English to German because English is a prestige language, more prestige has more prestige. So copying from English to German is okay, -ish, while copying from German to English is not okay. This is how he explained it. Cognitive process, cognitive pressures and register, and maybe uh, maybe different professional conventions in some registers. Like uh, for for technical uh, translation, you would uh, you would want to be less creative, probably, but more word for word, right? And that would be okay for this register. Okay, that's about done. Thank you for your time. Um, yeah. I'm done. Questions? Uh, we don't have the time, but if you have any questions. Yeah. Yeah, I have the paper. Are you done? So.
Have you entered your name to the no you haven't? No, you can check if you want. Check all your names on that already. I don't trust you. This is a test of how many people trust you. See how many people trust me? No, I don't know. I don't know. Is Stephen there? Yes, No, I can sign. Yeah, but you still have to sign. Yeah, but you still have to sign. Yeah, but you still have to sign. Yeah, but Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem, I'll do it right now. Oh, I'll stop. Thank you for being with me uh, online, for those who are online there. I will stop the recording now. Is there an attendance code? Yeah, I need to take, I'll take, have you, have you? So we are, yes, we are, we have an attendance online. So we have uh, Natalie, Anthony, Maria and Natalia online, attending online.